Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're chatting about loss, grief, and bereavement with special guests, Vicki J, CEO of the Texas-based National Alliance for Children's Grief, Lauren Schneider, Clinical Director of Child and Adolescent Programs at Our House Grief Support Center in Southern California, and Bev Warnock, the National Executive Director of Parents of Murdered Children that is based in Ohio. This is so important to discuss, and I am so appreciative that you've all made the time to, to talk about a difficult topic, but a topic that really uh, affects us all. It affects us all at some point in our lives. A death of a loved one is so very traumatic, especially when the situation is unexpected or violent. And today's social media saturated world can, can amplify the trauma that we feel. Um, it can remind us when we're trying to process, um, can uh, re-traumatize. And grief, it's, it, it's such a shared experience, yet so individual from person to person. So your services have to reflect uh, both of those realities. So, uh, Vicki, I'd like to start with you. Could you tell us about, uh, the, uh, about your mission over the National Alliance for Children's Grief? Thank you, Mark. Absolutely. But first, I really want to thank you and your group for bringing the topic to the table. So many times people don't want to talk about it. It is, as you said, the most universal topic, but yet it's sometimes the hardest one to talk about. So thanks for this opportunity. The NACG, the National Alliance for Children's Grief, um, exists ultimately to ensure that no child grieves alone. And translated, what that really means is that we strive to raise the awareness about all kinds of issues related to childhood grief and loss. And we work really hard to equip those that have the opportunity to work directly with children and teens. Um, first and foremost, we want people to understand that kids do grieve. And as simple as that sounds, it's not always understood. Um, maybe we recognize it, but we really don't want to deal with it. So sometimes it gets pushed a little bit to the back burner. Um, not only do they grieve, they need our support through their grief process. And you mentioned this, but each child's grief journey and loss and experience is very unique. Um, as well as their response to it. But they all deserve, I think, we think, they all deserve the community um, of people who are equipped to walk with them, um, beside them through, through their grief experience. You know, it's, it, it, it's so interesting because grief and the source of grief can be seemingly mundane or obviously traumatic when um, a parent goes away um, and, and may be on a, on a, on a trip, right? the child is, is suddenly bereft of that parent. That's, that's a small uh, little example. And then when a grandparent or a parent uh, passes, you have this, this enormous event. Lauren, how do you see the constellation of, of experiences that lead to grief uh, within the context of, of your programs? It really depends on the age of the child, Mark, and, you know, the circumstances of the death. The each griever is so unique. So we have to, you know, we, we look at each person that walks through our doors in such an individual way. And, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking of some current examples um, that are new, you know, um, new ways that people are grieving because of having been in isolation last year and now suddenly back in school and having to relearn how to socialize and do that when they're in the midst of grieving or grieving a death due to, uh, due to COVID where they feel guilty and worried that the family is blaming them because they're the ones who started, who brought the COVID into the home. You know, these are some of the, you know, new things that we're having to learn. But we look at each child and teen in a, in a very, very individualized way. And so uh, you're, you're raising a really important point. The whole idea is that during the pandemic, 
grief had to unfold in a fundamentally different way. And you had to adjust, your staffs had to adjust and, and families need to, needed to figure out. We had some losses in our family and, and you know, distance made things so very difficult. Yeah. Um, we had uh, visits where we couldn't actually see, um, see the person uh, in hospital. Um, and, and what do you do? What do you do? You just sort of uh, process. Bev, you, your organization takes it to another level because we are talking about the loss um, in families of children who are murdered. Uh, mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about how your organization came about and how you serve your constituents? Okay, our organization started in 1978 um, when a Cincinnati couple, their daughter was murdered in Germany by uh, the ex-boyfriend. Um, when coming back to the States, um, they couldn't... Um, couldn't function. So they had to find some way to begin a new life. Uh, grief with, with murder is a little different because it's violent and, um, you know, it happens suddenly. You don't have time to say goodbye. They're sick or, you know, in an accident. It's just a little bit is somewhat different than um, with grief, with murder, with our families. And our mission is to try to help the families um, cope with the grief. Um, we have a national conference so they can come together to bond with other families Um, It helps them to be in support groups. We have over 40 chapters all over the United States to um, get together, um, of course, now by Zoom. And, you know, it's their way to to reconstruct their life. It's before the murder, after the murder. You know, they feel like they have a contagious disease. A lot of people will stay away from them because they think it will happen to them. And murder happens to everybody. It doesn't matter, you know, where they live. who they're with, it, it happens. And, and it's something they have to deal with. They're thrown into the justice system that they have no idea how to handle. So that is our mission is to help them with all the things that come with the aftermath of murder. And we, we actually um, do not deal with children. Um, all of our family, they have to be over 18. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a child. It could be a sibling. It could be a grandchild. Uh, you know, any anyone can, um, you know, be part of our organization if they've had someone murder, coworker, friend, anyone. What strikes me about about your organizations and this moment in particular, uh, this, this this moment of grieving, is that in other areas, if you have homelessness, there is a tendency to blame the person who is homeless. If you have poverty, there's a tendency to blame the person who is impoverished, right? There is no, in, in terms of grief, there is no blame. All you have is, is the person where they are and meeting them where they are. In many respects, it seems that you can be a model for how we function as a, as a society. Uh, does it, would any of you care to comment in terms of the, the diversity of people who come in through your doors and how you meet them and how, how you, you basically function in terms of your intake the first the first contact that you have. Uh, Vicki, uh, uh, why don't you start? Um, when somebody comes in, who, who is that person? Um, how old are they? Um, what is their uh, race, their income, their, or does it not just, it just doesn't matter? Um, a couple of thoughts, and then I'm actually going to defer to Lauren because she does this in a more direct way than I do. Our organization is the connector. So we try to connect people to their local support organizations and programs. But what I would say is that in individuals, we serve children, um, usually school age children. So usually four to 18 to 21, depending on um, the programs. Um, But they come with all that they are in their past. They bring their family, their culture, their traditions, their history of loss, their experiences to this current situation that causes them to seek help or support. So the people who are who are coming to your alliance members, they are they are male, female different orientations, different identities, all of the above races, different economic. It's everybody is just a person in grief. They are. And another thing, Mark, I'd point out is that that there's a lot of different things that cause loss and the types of loss and sudden and expected. And Bev's talking about the very unexpected and, and 
we really work hard with our kids not to compare loss because for them, it's their loss. And that's the most important horrific loss they can imagine. So it doesn't matter if it was quote unquote, just, you know, an expected older grandparent or a very unexpected sibling to them. It's the loss of somebody they loved and cared about. And it's, as important as anybody else's loss. So, um, and, you know, and, we, and culturally appropriate services is also important because absolutely. where people come from, right? Their, their lived experience and the support that they might have from somebody who knows their experience, that's also part of what you're Absol- what your group Absolutely. Is about. And Beth mentioned it, and Lauren and I, in our programs, peer support is huge because they don't want to be the only ones. Whether you're a child or an adult, you want to be with other people who Mm -hmm. understand that, you know, they're not the only ones. I don't want to be the only one that is in this world that this death has caused. So um, peer support is just such an impactful tool across all of the programming that we do. So uh, Lauren, I, I got a question from uh, Jolyn Walker. She, uh, she said, um, are there any times when young adults, you know, 16 to 18 years old, look for your services on their own? How do they, how do they come to an organization like yours uh, since you serve uh, children and, uh, and adolescents? Um, how do so they, how high do school they age children is what the question was. We do occasionally have a call from a teenager. Usually it is um, initiated by their school counselor that makes them aware of our resource and they'll, they'll place the call themselves. And we do try and involve their grown up in the intake process that we do with each family. You know, Vicki mentioned that we do support groups. Most of the members of the National Alliance for Children's Grief um, are not mental health centers. We do what we call grief support, which is um, a support group um, often facilitated by volunteers. So with that 16 or 17 year old, we would try and um, include their grown up because what we know, um, what we one of the things that we do know to be very, very true, because there's a lot of things that aren't true about grief. But one thing that is very true is that um, the conditions in their caregiving environment are very important to how that person is going to adjust to their life without the person who died. So we, we really want to know whether that um, their grown up is supportive of them getting the grief support services the team wants. And in fact, I will always try and get the adult into our adult program as well, because we have a we have a separate adult program um, for a- any adult, whether they have a child or not at our at our agency in Los Angeles. So um, we just completed a poll in which we had, we had 91% of the people responding so that they had experienced uh, the types of uh, losses that we're talking about uh, today. Bev, in terms of uh, people coming in, you know, they come in after a violent act. Um, mm-hmm. Could you talk a little bit about that experience? Because in your particular case, as you said, unplanned for, unexpected, violent, impossible, impossible to process in the moment. Could you just give us a sense of if, if that happens to a friend of ours, what, what are they going through and how we can encounter them and how we can in some way be supportive? Um, so if you could give you the example of how people come into you and, and their transformation over the, over the first stages. Sure. Um, Our office is located in Cincinnati, Ohio, and we are national. So we don't really actually have people come into our office, but they call, email. um, And yes, if it was a friend, we can tell them to listen to them, um, talk to them, um, help them as much as you can, maybe get them to attend a support group, attend with them. Um, You know, the main thing is listening to them. Um, People get tired of listening to their story, you know, after they tell time after time, could be five years down the road and they're still grieving. Um, just because of, you know, the type of death. 
unfortunately, now domestic violence is just really on the rise. So, you know, it could be their daughter was murdered by the husband and then they have grandchildren to raise. I mean, it adds all kinds of new things to their life. And, you know, that's a difficult thing to do. But, you know, the main thing that we tell if someone calls and they're calling for someone else is to be able to listen to them and let them talk, let them grieve. You know, one of the hardest things, and we've heard this quite often, is men and, and women grieve different. Um, and men sometimes tend to not grieve. Um, they try to hold it all in, which is is extremely, you know, bad for them because that usually develops um physical problems later in their life, if they hold that in, you know, you need to grieve, you, you know, we call it the journey of grief, you need to go on that journey, you need to get it out. Um, you need to be able to talk about it to whoever you can, if your family doesn't listen to you anymore, that's when friends come in or a support group helps immensely. We used to have the attitude in this country that there was a separation between mind, emotion, body, and and so on. Uh, Bev, do you do you feel like there's more of a uh, more of a connection, and we're recognizing that connection? You you talked about holding it in and having that that sort of backup on you physically. Do you think that 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 there's really this this sort of holistic connection between how we feel, how we think, how we act, our our, our physical selves? Yes, I do. Um, I think after you've had a murder in your family, you don't know how to act. You don't have any, you can't feel you're in shock for, you know, a long time. So it really changes your personality, your, your way of life, um, your functioning, um, capabilities. Um, so yes, it, it does. It changes your whole life, you know, with the murder. And we, we sometimes say, you know, it is different than just a, um, death of a grandparent because they have so many questions. They don't know why it happened. Um, and there's sometimes those questions can't get answered. That is the, one of the hardest things for our families is not knowing why, not knowing, you know, what happened. And then they also have the guilt. Why did I let them go out that night? That this wouldn't have happened if they went out or why did I, you know, let them do whatever happened to, you know, for the murder to happen. And, and the guilt is sometimes, you know, the worst thing for them. And it's hard to, you know, get them through the guilt of why it happened. Um, we just completed a poll, Vicky. I'm going to I'm going to uh, go, uh, come to you with a, with a question based on it. Um, we asked, "Do you think that uh, what do you think are the three most useful ways to cope with grief?" And and those areas that got the most support were was accepting support from friends and family, and and uh, then we had sort of avoiding destructive habits and creating structure around grief through prayer, ritual, and so on and so forth. In terms of the services that, that your folks provide, uh, Vicki, um, how do you look at this? Is this it, it, are, are there certain sort of themes? In this particular case, the feedback was creating structure around grief and ritual through, uh, through prayer or, or whatever the ritual might be, um, uh, uh, avoiding destructive habits, um, uh, family support. Are there... Um, are there particular, um, if you look at all the services that are provided, are there particular categories that seem to be uh, particularly powerful in your field? You know, we, as you were talking about with De Bev, we recognize that it is the whole child that experiences the loss. And we try to um, have programs and tools that reach each part of that child. So, you know, uh, children express grief very differently. And what is helpful to them is a little bit different than might be what's helpful to those of us on this call um, as adults. So, you know, just because a child is playing doesn't mean that they're not grieving. Play is often their tool. So the tools that we use and resources involve movement and music and um, expressive arts, as well as um, things in community, as well as things in solidarity where you're alone. Um, and, um, you know, I think one of the things that we need to know is that to be able to recognize a person as a griever is the number one thing. Schools, for instance, um, it affects a child's performance, academic performance. But many times school teachers assume that child is just acting out or not able to keep up or distracted because of who they are without looking that one step deeper to say, you know, really what's behind that is a recent loss um, in that child's life. And so 
um, we really try to address. It's not just what happens in the peer group, which is probably our best, you know, modal uh, modality to reach kids. Uh, but it's what, what happens in all parts of their life. How do they interact socially? Has their role changed at home? They're no longer a big sister. They're no longer, you know, a child. How, how has that changed? So it's across all of them as a whole person. I'm not sure I answered your question exactly. Oh, you answered, you answered it fine. I, I wanted to ask uh, Lauren as, as, a, as a clinical director, um, I have a, kind of a complicated question to ask. If you look at dealing with grief, there are all sorts of different um, elements that you all mentioned. There's the idea of, of confronting grief, but also diverting from it, not becoming obsessed in a cycle of, of looking at grief. So there's diversion and there's also focus, right? There's physical activity. There's also rest, right? There are, there are a lot of different approaches that that seem to be um, just sort of really different from each other. And it seems that part of what we have to do is navigate a future that integrates this experience um, for us in a way that is positive. So as a, as a clinical director, you don't want anyone to go to an extreme of, of just constant diversion and not dealing. On the other hand, you don't want people to go to obsession. How do you look at a clinical approach that helps people to find their own balance, that allows them to explore and not sort of have a paternalistic medical kind of approach? This is the right formula, formula for you. How, do you. how do you navigate that between the expertise that you might have, but also respecting that each person has to find their own path? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, I'm still kind of reflecting on the previous question, though, too, with what Vicki said in the answers to the poll, that I do feel like one thing that was really missing from their response to that poll was how important the peer group is, because the family, although the adult in the family may say, let's keep this in the family, um, culturally, that's often the case. The child may not feel comfortable expressing themselves to the adult in the family because they don't want to make them more sad. So we get them away into a room without their adult present or even without their siblings sometimes if they're different ages. And then they have the freedom to express themselves without worrying about how it impacts their adult. So for your viewers, that's why these peer groups, we also run a grief camp. We're part of the Camp Aaron Network. The camp or the grief group at school, whether it's at school or a center like our house, is so important that for the child to have their own safe space to express whatever they need to do. You know, and then Vicki has the resources to help people find that all over the country, has the list. So um, back to your other question, though. Um, well, I just wanted you know, to say, you know, we've gotten a number of comments saying, uh, uh, just sort of thanking you for for okay. uh, for covering that. We yeah. did ask the question. That was interesting. We did ask about um, uh, support from peers who are not part of the family. Nobody answered that, but it, but you're saying it's a very important piece. Yeah, because especially teens, they always tell us that their friends aren't there for them anymore. They almost always say after the first couple of weeks, the friends, they feel abandoned by their peer group and more isolated um, than is comfortable for them. And they need a new peer group to identify with as a teenager that is a positive peer group. Um, we don't want them to find a peer group um, out of that need for um, identity that is not a positive peer group. And sometimes we've seen that happen if they don't join an our house group or another grief support group. But um, so on the I, clinical uh, yeah, question in terms yeah. of, of ju clinical judgment. So um, we do, like most centers, follow a, um, a specific model that's a nonlinear model, and we address certain goals with anybody who participates in the program, um, goals to help them 
you know, with their thoughts, with their feelings, um, adjust to their life without the person who died, but also maintain the bond with that person who died. And we're not telling them to forget about them and get over it. We want them to maintain that connection, especially because it, it, most of the time it's a positive in their life. So we're always working on these goals, but not in a linear way. So um, like last week, we were doing Dia de los Muertos projects, um, you know, whether that was the person's culture or not, because that's a perfect a perfect holiday observance for all grieving children and teens to honor the memory of their own loved ones who've died in this very colorful, upbeat way. So that that's we're working on that particular goal that we have in our treatment goals um, versus another week where we might focus more on feelings. Plus, last thing, and then I'll be quiet. We also teach them coping strategies from mindfulness, breathing techniques, and all those things to address what you were saying earlier, to help them with their that mind-body connection, to calm themselves when they experience big feelings, or you can't focus in class. You know, Bev, um, I'm, I'm mindful of, of what uh, Lauren is saying, and also, um, if you look at the life of our president, uh, Biden, who uh, suffered loss um, through uh, an accident and then through the death of his son uh, by, by uh, uh, cancer, um, you know, it, it, there's a sequence. Um, he talks about the fact that at a certain point, you can refer to the loss, uh, the loved one that has been lost uh, with a smile. Um, but there's a sequence that you have to go through. And Lauren was, was just referring to it. Um, could you uh, just help us to understand that sequence um, that where, where we can be supportive of someone who has suffered such a, such a traumatic loss? Sure. There's different stages of grief, you know, your beginning stages, um, you know, where you're in shock and, and, you know, traumatized and, and the pain does soften. Uh, we also say it never goes away, but it does soften. And, you know, eventually you can just remember the good memories that you had of your loved one. And that helps you get through um, the time, um, the anniversary of their death, their birthday, special holidays. Um, the memories are, you know, the best thing that you have to you know concentrate on for the day and then you start to to relive the memories and you can maybe laugh and and start to enjoy life um you know after after your time everybody the, the time you can't put a time on your grief everybody grieves different in different times different ways um so you know it just depends so and we also see the mem uh, memorial uh, memorialization of uh, people mm -hmm. who have been lost through um the development of of different initiatives. Sometimes they're very small initiatives. Sometimes they're very large, each of them equally significant in their own ways. Um, how do you help adults and children um, create some sort of a memorial that marks uh, the significance of their loved one? Except for me, we have a murder wall um, that families can put their loved one's name on and every year, um, we take that murder wall to our national conference that's held in different parts of the United States. The next year, it'll be in St. Louis, 2022. Um, and we, um, you know, honor the murder wall, honor the loved ones that are on there. Um, and that's how they can, you know, they can come and they can also honor and memorialize their loved one by our murder wall. We've talked a lot about about death. and We did get a prompt uh, from, from uh, one of our uh, viewers asking about, uh, grief that is not associated with with uh, uh, loss through the death of a loved one. Uh, Vicki, could you talk a little bit about what you've experienced, particularly during this COVID time, that is uh, about grief, that is about loss, but isn't necessarily associated with, with the death of a loved one? You know, I think in this last whatever 18 months or so, we as a nation are grieving unified more than ever before. Um, we perceive that we've lost a lot, um, both real and, and perceived. But um, during this time, particularly, loss um, is real prevalent in our thinking. 
And so, and there's not the typical support systems in place. So you mentioned even Mark and your personal um, family, you've had some losses and there were additional challenges because of COVID with distancing and, and lack of contact and all that. And that definitely has played into death loss, but it, everything that plays into death loss also plays into other losses. I think for our organizations, the three represented, we all focus on loss due to death, but we are also very cognizant that um, there are a lot of losses that happen in our life. And, you know, from a child's um, experiencing deployment and incarceration and, um, you know, divorce, all those things are losses in that child's life. And so very many of the tools that we um, implement and the thoughts and understandings we have about children in grief, as well as adults in grief, it doesn't really matter the cause of loss. Some of the same things, you know, permeate across, across all losses. So we just uh, completed another poll and, and we're coming to the end of our time. Uh, we're going to go to you, Lauren, and then we're going to wind up with, with you, Bev. Bev will have the last word. The uh, poll was, you know, have any of the following ever stopped you from seeking help and support when struggling with the death of someone close? And we found that, that there's a denial, there's a fear of being vulnerable. That's a big, big, big issue. I mean, it, it basically 55% of respondents uh, answered in that way. And then the, the whole idea that grief is too personal to share, um, couldn't talk with my family, uh, didn't know what to expect, didn't know what to do, was, was kind of frozen. Uh, all those were, were part of this. But, but one of our uh, members actually prompted um, this, this, this question. You know, we have attitudes. Um, suicide is a sin. You know, those kinds of issues. Uh, Lauren, uh, could you talk about barriers and how we can help our, our friends, our families, ourselves overcome those barriers? Because we do sometimes, we're human beings, we sometimes have need. Um, how, do we, how do we process those issues? If we, if we are deeply religious in a way that processes suicide as a sin, um, how do we deal with that? It's, that's a really tough one, you know, because uh, we may not ever get access to that particular child if the family has that stringent of belief about it and about seeking support outside the family or outside of the church, let's say. We have a way of helping children understand suicide as the result of a, a medical problem of an, of an illness. And we help the children come to terms with the fact with it that way that their person died due to a disease, whether it's a disease related to substance abuse or a disease related to a mental health problem. And that helps the children. It takes the stigma out of it that the family is um, being impacted by in the community, possibly. But and and then the child also feels that they fit in with other people in their peer group, in their in their grief group, who also had loved ones die due to medical conditions. And almost overwhelmingly, suicides are due to a medical condition um, of either the two sorts that I mentioned. So Mark, there's nothing there I, that would yeah, be against I, any type of religious practice is 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 what you're what you're suggesting, Lauren. I'm sorry, Vicki, go ahead. I, I just had a thought that I can't help but share. Um, we've learned from our survivors so much that the media doesn't help with that sometimes because we all use, and it's habit, but we all use the word commit. And commit means usually related to a sin or a crime. So if we can just change our languaging around suicide to say they died by suicide, death by suicide, um, took their own life, just other words that kind of take that negative connotation of commit out of the conversation, it helps our families so much. So, so basically what you're, what you're suggesting is not in contravention to any belief system. What you're no. basically suggesting is that we should just look at, at uh, the survivors, try to um, treat them with respect and empathy and not 
try and stigmatize or try to not stigmatize and just accept, embrace support. Mm -hmm. Right. And kids often don't um, embrace the beliefs of the adults in their family. They're grieving that adult, whether or not they might have a relative who believes um, from the religious perspective. I just don't hear that, that suicide is a sin anymore. That's that went away probably 20 years ago, I think, when I first started doing the work. I don't hear that from the families that actually show up. But, um, yeah, I'll stop with that. We're going to give you the last word uh, because um, one of the things that, that really strikes me is that we, through our social media, are far more exposed to these events that used to be isolated and covered only in the local press. And now we instantly have access. So we have not only um, do people experience the personal trauma of loss, uh, particularly when, I, when, um, when someone is murdered, but we all become part of that experience in many respects. So now we all have a responsibility to, to help in the healing? What can we all do to help in that, guys? What can I do tomorrow to be a better person in that respect? If I'll speak, I'll say you've already started the conversation. You know, just putting the conversation on the table and letting people talk about death and dying and, mm -hmm. and all those things related to it, making it a conversation that is easy versus one that is, um, you know, not comfortable. And then in our case, we have tons of tools on our website, how to talk to a child about death, how to explain a funeral, you know, how to have those conversations, um, you know, look for resources. If you're grieving, unfortunately, have had a, a loss in your own life, don't be afraid to ask somebody for help. Let somebody know you need help. And if you're all the rest of us who are lucky right now that we're not grieving a, a death at this moment, then, you know, look for ways to help others. And the resources that are available both on BEVs and ours are usually free. We're here to serve. We, we're here to um, equip everybody to have the tools and the conversations and the resources we need. The investment we make now in each other creates healthy communities down the road. So I just want to say thank you, Mark, for putting this topic on the table. Mm -hmm. Lauren, would you endorse that, that whole idea of just sort of coming together that Vicki um, uh, yeah, Vicky uh, said uh, it so well, and and it, and um, earlier Beth Beth also added um, the importance of just listening because friends and family can't fix it for other people. There isn't like magic words to say, but just listening, being present, checking in with people. And, and just being there with them for as long, as long as they need. It's, um, it doesn't go away after a month, you know. Um, so I think that was very helpful when Bev mentioned that. So I want to reinforce that. Just mm -hmm. listen. Yes. And I agree with that. We have families say that their friends stop talking to them because they don't want to hear about their grief or they don't want to watch them cry. You know, what kind of friend is that? Um, that won't help them to, you know, or let them cry and uh, talk about their loved one. But we hear that all the time. Listen, let's just be there for each other. Right. Uh, Vicki J, CEO of the Texas-based National Alliance for Children's Grief, Lauren Schneider, the clinical director of children and adolescent programs at our house grief support center in Southern California, and Bev Warnock, national executive director of parents of murdered children based in Ohio. Thank you so much for sharing the experiences from around the country. And there's so much, we have so much in common in this country. Mm -hmm. we, can, we can actually uh, learn from each other, share, collaborate. It's wonderful, wonderful that, that you're here. We will post links to your website um, on the YouTube and other, and other uh, video posts. Uh, Tina, you just asked, and, and we'll make sure that that's, that that's done. Uh, thank you uh, attendees for, uh, for asking all your great questions. And please all thank your staffs, 
Thank your donors, thank your communities, thank the people, the volunteers who have experienced grief themselves and are helping others to process. Thanks so much and stay safe. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.